Yes, absolutely. Because I wanted to, um, we can go right into it. If you've got any questions, please go right ahead. So formatting wise, the first page, that is what you want to, so we can put the title, like I was thinking position paper one, conflict, and then you lay out the prompt. So like, like on the front, you say the whole thing you gave us, I really don't like conflict, I could, that whole thing right then you put group a with your or group with your names and yeah. then you put your immediate one paragraph response and that's that's all you want on the first page then you well this this is the way you can do it 600 words only in the text so i mean that doesn't include your name so at the upper right hand i'd like you to put your group letter mm -hmm. your four your, your four or five group members whoever they are you can put that quote in there and it's your response that's the 600 words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you would state in the first paragraph whether you agree or not. Mm -hmm. And then you can just let it spill on to another page, your justifications. So based upon whatever you see, I do not believe I can do this. And then you would go into your reasoning, whatever that would be. And it would take you maybe two pages. And then after the two pages, or right after that, you could put in your bibliography if you have one. So only one person needs to um, turn it in, in your group. So just one person, you all will have the same group. And then at the end of the semester, you'll have an online group evaluation. And I take those evaluations into account if someone's not doing anything. I've, I had an A student last, semester I had to give a B because they did not contribute. I hate doing that, but everybody needs to contribute in a group, no matter no matter how small it is. Okay. So yeah. So I mean that's how it's done. So the bibliography that you don't want that accounted for in the 600 words. That's strictly the response, right? Right. Okay. And, and it doesn't have to be 600 words, but I really would hate if it were less than 500 because the subject needs to be flushed out. I mean, you'll, you're talking about, you know, two pages, double space, time room, and 12 point font. Yeah. You know, it'll fill two pages easily. So, and it'll be due, I, I don't know if it says Thursday or Wednesday, but it's due Thursday at 11.59 at night. Okay, so you can turn it in any time. While I'm doing this, I want to announce also that there will not be any class in-house on Thursday, because I would like you, if you have a chance to go attend the thing at the conference center, um, you don't have to, but if you go in and you sign in, I will give you three points on your next test. Okay, um, so what you'll look for Thursday is we won't be in class, but you will have a video of the next or the continuation or the finishing on this. Okay, so that would be that will be next class, but once again, we won't be in here. Okay. Yes. Another question. Sure. Um, do we have to have like a bibliography or like sources? Because no. I don't know exactly like what. What I would you about. look for? Yeah. Uh, one of the things I don't even mind if you use the book, and if you're looking at the definition of what conflict is. All right, so if you define conflict and you use it in the text of the, the you, you know, the statement in and of itself, that would be a reason why. I mean, any kind of research, as a matter of fact, even if you go online and look at a website and, and look up this situation in one way or another, you know, within, within Word, you can put in a reference for a website. So, I mean, that would be an example, all right? and and. The one thing to avoid to get a better grade is avoid, I guess, or I think, or anything like that. You know, I want a strongly worded statement, and I want the statement to be based on facts, whatever those facts are, okay? And if the facts are just based upon your own personal experiences, I'm almost okay with that as long as it's just not, I guess, or generalizations or characterizations that, you know, that don't work. So, you know, 
anything is better. Now, the next subjects so that we start talking about, you're going to be able to do a lot more research on. Okay, so, you know, this is almost kind of a warm up. You can get, you know, into it. And then I think the next one we're going to talk about is franchising um, and franchising, or excuse me, retailing, and it'll be retailing of autonomous vehicles, I think, which is an interesting subject in and of itself. I was reading, I was reading an article about autonomous vehicles, and I got into this um, thing about auton autonomous vehicles, and I realized they're trying to make their artificial intelligence do entirely more than they should. You're, the, you're letting the artificial intelligence of a vehicle determine whether or not your car should crash based upon the number of individuals in the car. I'm serious. I've read this online. And I thought to myself, that is way beyond the pay grade of some you know, artificial intelligence chip. And they use the technology acceptance model for saying that well, people will go along with this. But artificial intelligence is an entirely different bailiwick. And anyway, I'm going on on this, but you know, the, the premise would be that autonomous vehicles would better be uh, done in retail establishments. And you'll have to decide that. Anyway, any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Um, in text citations, do you want those in um, APA? APA. So is that like, it would be like the author's name and the year? Like yeah, if you let me let me show you the easy way. Did you did I show this? Let me show you the best way that you can do this. Here, I'll show it to you. So come on, where's Word? I hate when it doesn't just stick out. Um, Word. There we go. So let me show you an easy way to do a bibliography. Um, blank document. So, so you have your document here and you're working in Word and you wanna put a reference in, okay? So let's say you have a reference. If you click up here where it says references, look up here where it says manage sources. And so if you noticed, I've already put some sources in there. So this is how you do it. Let's say we're gonna put a journal article in. This is how you do it. So you do click new and it's a journal article. And so let's add some authors. Okay, so click okay. Title, uh, let's see. Okay, in the journal. Uh, you put in the year. Oops. Pages are usually important um, because, especially if they define by volume or issue. So once you do that, come down to volume and issue. Um, they've been doing volume and issue instead of dates or months. So click OK. And so if you notice, it's in there now. Watch this. So I am going to copy all of those over. And I'm going to close this. Now watch what happens. If you click on bibliography and you do insert bibliography, it does it all for you. Real simple. Let me also show you this. If you notice, it says APA style. I can go here, change it to Chicago style does it all for you. One of the real cool things there, okay? And then, you know, all you have to do is just highlight it and then change it to Times Roman and 12 point and you've got it all done. There you go. Yeah, I was thinking like, whenever we're referencing it in our 600 words, like, mm -hmm. um, do you want us to do like a abbreviated, like okay. reference, like, where you put parentheses and the author's name. Oh, oh, is just this. Just this. Okay. That's all you have to do. And the bibliography doesn't count okay. for the 600 words. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, any, you know, I mean, APA style is fine for me. And you have no idea what a time saver this is, believe me. 
Um, so um, just use this as a way of getting it. And with the um, book, mm -hmm. in referencing the book, do you want us to put like chapter five, like the one about channel conflict, like reference the chapters we use specifically? Generally, what you'll do in the book chapter is, uh, I think you'll do that. If it is a direct quotation, then you have to put exactly which page it was on. Yeah. But if you do new and you're doing a book section, or you do just a book, usually if you notice, these are the key things. And where you see the titles, those are the most important things. Um, and uh, of that, you know, you can, I would, I would put in probably the page number and, and that would be it. Okay. Okay. And then you'll, you'll be okay. I wouldn't put on like quote unquote. Right. More so just a general idea and stuff. Sure. Sure. No problem. Yeah. I mean, you know, anything in the book is a reference. I mean, any definition is the only things is, of course, if you use like the exact wording in, in anything, when you're doing research, you must put literally the page that it's on. And you can have some journal articles, by the way, when you're doing stuff. If you have three quotations in the journal article, they'll just reject it. So, you know, you keep the quotations away. Okay. All right. So let us start and talk about chapter seven. So wholesalers have been around for a long time. Wholesalers have a unique structure. They are important in the system and yet they are kind of unique, very much so, because one of the things that wholesalers have especially is that they don't touch the end users, that their functions primarily happen between that area somewhere in the middle. If we look at wholesalers in a historical way, you know, wholesalers are traditionally a go-between between the manufacturers and items that are mass produced and the smaller re retailers that require a variety of items. Now, wholesalers have been around for a long time. Uh, the, the roles change and evolve, but wholesalers to their um, better. So if I were looking at manufacturers of items here, and I were looking at the wholesaler, what the wholesaler's vision to provide is to provide to their retail members. And so a wholesaler's vision is to see what's going on in the retailers and how to help them. Um, the interesting thing about it is, is that 83% of all of the distributors and wholesalers that are out there nationwide are actually under $10 million in annual revenues. So there's actually a lot of room, and I'm going back and forth on this, there's a lot of room for wholesalers out there, but then by the very same token, there's an enormous amount of consolidation that has gone on in the wholesale industry as well. So what does a wholesaler do? So I have manufacturers of cigarettes, I have manufacturers of soda or soft drinks, and I have manufacturers of beer, and those are generic manufacturers that produce goods for consumers, all right? Doesn't matter who they sell to. On the bottom, I have mom and pop stores. These are just um, convenience stores who basically sell goods that are convenient, all right? And they have needs and desires. But the difficulty with these mom and pop stores are that quite simply, they don't have the volume and mass to be able to order in the quantities that the manufacturers demand. So like manufacturers will add or order by a skid and a skid is like six foot on a square and it stands six feet tall and there's no way that a mom and pop store can do that. But an intermediary can, a wholesaler can. A wholesaler can collect a bunch of mom and pop needs together. 
Not only that, but they can focus on what are the best goods that mom and pops have and what they sell, and that they can focus on them as consumers in a way, and they can take their collective needs, put it all together into one single purchase. These manufacturers send directly to the wholesalers. The wholesalers prefer perform the demand side function of breaking bulk, and it starts sending those goods downstream to the retailers. And this is what wholesalers do. They don't sell to the, gen, the uh, general public, but because their focus is serving the industry that they're in, they provide an extremely valuable function and they're very desirable. Um, you can't live in a modern world without it. So what is the definition? Wholesaling refers to business establishments that do not sell many products, I, I kind of like that because they, some are, to ultimate householders or end users. Generally, as a rule of thumb, they sell to businesses below them, retailers, merchants, contractors, industrial users, commercial users. They're very closely associated with tangible goods, but it's important for you to understand that they provide an enormous service as well. They provide a midpoint for those mom and pop stores that without them not existing, mom and pop simply couldn't survive. What is important to realize though in the whole process is that it's an intermediate step. And so the intermediate quite simply means is they stay in that intermediary between the manufacturer and the end user, who of course performs channel functions. And that's where they live. They live in that bandwidth right in there. So what is it about wholesaling that makes it so unique and unique? The most significant thing about wholesalers and distributors, they're independently owned. They're not owned by a manufacturer at all. They buy and sell products. Here's the key of which they claim ownership. What does that mean? It means that when the beer and the soft drink and the cigarette manufacturers sell to the wholesalers, the wholesalers take title. They take title and they take physical ownership. And what that means is in the critical phase is that they set prices that once they get past the manufacturer, they themselves are the controller of whatever happens downstream. Now you can have manufacturer retail prices all you want, and that's possible, but the ultimate point is, is that they sell to the retailers at whatever price they want, okay? And they have an enormous influence on the USA economy, they do. So they're not really selling to like the Walmarts no. as much as like gas stations. No. Like and and the key that's a good point also the larger kind of retailers like walmart or whatever they have their entire own system as well and so walmart in the 90s went away from wholesalers for good period okay now they may deal with some i'm not quite sure but they do the wholesaling process they have a series of these 57 outlets all across the United States that does in essence, the work that a wholesaler does. In other words, they are the middleman, okay? They've created their own wholesaling item. Now, if you work for a Lowe's or you work for someone else, it's very possible you could have a middleman to do that. Lowe's Foods actually doesn't own their own meat. They actually buy from the North Carolina Cattlemen's Association. So they have a middleman as well. Okay. Yeah, so there is a distinction, a historical one by wholesalers and distributors, and I see this slide up and, you know, I, I, I want you to know the distinction, it might, you know, win you a bet at a bar, but I don't think it's much more than that. There is a difference between a wholesaler and a distributor. So wholesaler refers to a company that resells products to another intermediary. 
such as a retail, um, pharmacies, those kind of things. And so that's the, the strict definition of what a wholesaler is. A distributor sells products to industrial customers. And so an example like this would be a, oh gosh, a pipe wholesaler who sells pipes and, um, oh gosh, uh, fittings to a plumber and the plumber uses that to be able to fix a bathroom. That would be the difference. Wholesalers and distributors have titles to the goods they sell. And as far as we're concerned, there's no difference. So if you see distributor on a test or wholesaler on the test, it means the same thing. But historically, these were the differences are. But if you want to say, no, nah, a distributor ain't a wholesaler, you can pull this definition up and say strictly not. Okay. So, but as far as you're concerned, no, it doesn't matter. So what is the landscape out there for wholesalers and distributors? What does it look out there? I mean, what has it been historically? I mean, what has horse wholesaling been like? Well, the first thing to realize is that wholesaling has gone through a wave of consolidation for decades now. And that even though 83% of them make 2 million or less, the truth is, is that two thirds of the companies have gone. And the thing about it is, is that there's no concern about it because the consolidation hasn't meant a loss of jobs. It just actually means that the consolidation has been done because of efficiencies. So you supply chain people, you're the reason why, all right? Because the efficiencies of supply chain, which mean the enhancement of long-term performance through strategically coordinating the movement of goods has become so efficient that when wholesalers get to a certain economies of scale, they can make much more money. And so what you find is the consolidation strengthens the distributor network while it reduces the numbers, but it's not reducing the number of people. What it also says that it's important to realize, if you remember this back from chapter two, is that just because you eliminate the people or the, the people in the mix, you can't eliminate the channel functions. And so everything that was performed by five companies, it's now consolidated to two, all of those functions still need to be provided. And so there has been this main shifting all over the place, but the truth is, is that none of it has been because of bankruptcy, nobody's shutting down, they're just consolidating organizations together and it's making the whole system better. So it's actually a good thing. So, despite all of that, concentration does remain low and that there is a fragmentation, but it doesn't reflect the, the concentration of itself. And big corporations are not necessarily more powerful than others because power is property of a relationship and not the business itself and not the business size. We can find large distributors and small distributors doing just as well in given mar markets. And it has nothing to do with the fact that they may be bigger than others, but they have just as much power because of the powers that they have in the relationship. I worked in Morgan City in Louisiana at a place called Port Hardware. And we had a very loyal base of customers, especially the ones that worked offshore like Kermagee, Conoco, Diamond M, large corporations that would put bids through our system that were no less than outrageous when you consider a small hardware store. There were three of us in Morgan City, uh, Port Hardware, Morgan City Hardware, and I think Offshore Logistics, I can't remember the other. Anyway, three places and we would have these enormous bids come through and it, the, the fact that we had so much business going through was not a property of our business, but the fact that we had that relationship and the relationship was the power. 
So, given that we can have small organizations and they can be strong, we can also have big organizations, huge ones, all right? And there is what's known as a master distributor. You might even think of them as a super wholesaler. And these tend to be large organizations that have enormous abilities, all right? They tend to be the biggest dogs on the porch for lack of a better word. And the fact is that they're consolidators of services is what makes them even more important. It's one thing I also want to note, and I, I have to say this about wholesaling too. Wholesaling is all about service. How do we define service to the retailers? Because the service that we provide to the retailers many times is a close and better connection than to the end users, especially in industries that are complex and difficult. And so these master distributors not only are dealers of specialized products, but of specialized services as well. So I'll give an example. So like I said, I worked for Port Hardware. We were a, I don't know, a relatively small store that, you know, however you want to say it. And Port Hardware, we would get an order for 100,000 feet of quarter inch stainless steel tubing at $11 a foot. Now think about trying to order one and a half million dollars of stainless steel tubing. For any little smart organization, it was simply impossible. We, we couldn't do it. And not only would we get orders like that, but Port Hardware would as well. But we had a friend. We had a friend with big shoulders. And that company, oh, let's see, where are they? Where did I put them? Excuse me. Excuse me, I hate when it does that. Did I pop them out? Hold on. Yes, here they are. Sorry. The company that we worked with the most was Moody Price. So just to give you an idea, this was a company that specialized in oil field services and understanding. So I want you to look at these manufacturers on the bottom. These manufacturers were not necessarily specialized in oil field services. Parker Fittings, Swedge Lock, I and McDaniel, these were calibration pieces of equipment and they were general service equipments for many, many different industries. However, Moody Price understood the industry in itself. They had a connection to the oil fields and they understood very distinctly how those goods could be used in the oil field. So when myself would come from Port Hardware with a 100,000 foot order, we couldn't buy it, but we could consolidate the order with Moody Price and Moody Price could order. And so when they ordered it, not only could we buy it from them, but they could actually store it for us because where are we gonna put 100,000 feet of stainless steel tubing other than someplace where it could be stolen at $11 a foot, okay? so. This is the enormous advantage of a master distributor, a super wholesaler. Once again, they sell services, which may be the most critical thing that they do. Let me also add, as I talked about, not only do they sell equipment, which is what master distributors do, but they do other things like help educate you, like they have safety schools, they have custom parts, they will repair the equipment, they will even do things like help you inventory your offices, and they will even rent you specialized tools, which is pretty awesome, all right? Um, these are pieces of equipment that run in the tens of thousands of dollars, may only need to be used for first time or second time, but when you need them, you gotta have them. And so, as I said, the last thing that they also provide is they provide training as well. So this is what a master distributor does, a super wholesaler. 
They become consolidators of the things that we need. And so we pass our things up to Moody Price. Moody Price would buy the Parker fittings that we would need for sledge lock. We would buy from them and they would make money on the margins. And they did a great job and everybody won. So how did it work? This is an example. So you'd have multiple manufacturers, just like you had with Woody Price. They would all consolidate their things together to master distributors. The master distributors even sometimes work with wholesalers. They work directly to us. You would find retailers right here. And there were something like 1,300 of us. Now in Woody Price across the Southeast, there's like 1,300 stores they work with. And eventually it pushes out into the oil field industry and it's extremely successful. It works great for us, okay? So it allows us to have an enormous assortment, great delivery. And as I said before, they work as an invisible warehouse. So what it meant is, is that we had goods so we were in Morgan City and they were in Homa, which was 52 miles away. And all we had to could do if I needed 10,000 feet to go to the Conoco dock is they would ship us to get a hot shot, move it out to there and we'd have it whenever we needed. So we could actually have our goods on their warehouse or on their fields and we'd be taken care of and we'd be safe. And it works great. So not only that, but master distributors have a much deeper connection with their retailers or the wholesalers. It, it's a very intimate connection because they can demonstrate what's the best way of the practice. You have to, when you cut the ferrule on a stainless steel fitting, it has to be done in a certain way because the stainless steel fitting is holding something like 1200 pounds of pressure and it has to be done right. They can show us how to do that. Um, they can help us in advertising. The, their dimensions of scope help us to resolve logistic problems. And so it's all a win-win situation to have a master distributor in the group. Now, what are the other supply chain participants? They don't put agents here, but I want to put agents up there as well. Manufacturers can actually have branches out in a wholesale operation, like an oil field area. And they actually don't have the product there, they, but they can be there for technical support on how to do things and do things well, all right? So they don't have possession or inventory. They, they work as wholesale distributors. They may only have a single individual in the office in that area, but that one individual generally works on something that is complex and helps the wholesaling operations and the manufacturers in the area. Agents, manufacturers, agents are salespeople who do not take title or equipment, but represent more than one manufacturer. So, Purolator used to have a guy who was a manufacturer's agent in Morgan City. And if you don't think they use oil filters, oil filters on diesel engines have to be changed like every 500 hours. And they run diesel engines 24 hours a day. So they're changing filters maybe once a week. He had a new car every time I saw him. Um, so, I mean, that's an example. He never worked, he didn't work for Purolator, but he would take orders for them. And he had another broad, amount of equipment that he sold that was generally uh, around the, or the oil field in general. So the last thing I want to talk about before we go is I also want to talk about, so yeah, talk about agents, which are important, but I also want to talk about third-party logistics providers, okay? Third-party logistics providers, 3PLs, don't take title of the goods, but they have activities. They do activities in the process for which they charge an activity-based fee. 
So what would be an example like this? So in the Gulf of Mexico, you have two types of platforms. You have a drilling platform and you have a production platform. The production platforms are for those oil that has already been found and that it's being pumped to Cameron and other places in Louisiana. A drilling platform is that there's oil speculated and they're drilling. It costs anywhere from $400,000 a day because they don't buy them, they rent them. They rent the drilling pat platforms from like Harima and Schlumberger and other corporations. So Conoco Oil doesn't own the drilling platform, they rent it. So it can be as an inexpensive, as inexpensive as $400,000 a day to rent one within less than a thousand feet of water to a drilling ship, which can go down to five miles of water, which can be as much as $650,000 a day. So think about spending that money every day, 24 hours a day, you have to keep those things running at all times if you're going to get the most out of it. Now think about what happens if one hose breaks and it's costing you $650,000 a day when you have people on the oil rigs just sitting there twiddling their thumbs. So what is there? There is something that's called This is known as a hot shot, okay? So what is a hot shot? A hot shot is a truck, basically, all right? The trucks are there 24 hours a day. You call them up and they will move goods from point A to B in the fastest amount of time possible even if it means they're getting past or exceeding speed limits. That's why they're called hot shots. So my, my brother worked for a hot shot trucker. They can be as small as this, okay? They can be as small as a three quarter ton pickup or they can be giant 18 wheelers. But generally I've, I've seen this, I was called out at 2 a.m. in the morning. You needed a hose this long and it was a two inch stainless steel that could hold 3000 pound test. And it costs something like $4,000 for this little, you know, this little um, hose. But it was costing them $200,000 a day that time to hold up the entire place. So at 2 a.m. in the morning, I called this trucker or a trucker like it. He got there in 15 minutes, took off for Dulac, which is south of Louisiana. And he got there in time and got it delivered to the oil rig in like, six hours, which is kind of an example. This is an example of what's known as a third-party logistics provider. They provide an extremely important service, an enormous benefit, but the consumer pays an activity-based fee on the services they're rendered, okay? And as consolidation happens, you find fewer services performed by the larger groups, but you find growth in third party logistics providers. Because once again, you can take away the individuals in the system, but you can't take away the functions. All right, got us done quick. All right, remember, we won't be online Thursday. Um, I will have a, a uh, recording posted that will finish chapter eight wholesale. Okay, see you. Um, the conference that we were talking about